Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Public Audit and Post Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2020. Agenda item one is decision on taking business in private. I am assuming that everyone agrees unless a member un indicates otherwise. So does any member object to taking item four in private? Only raise your hand if you object. Members have agreed to take item four in private. Agenda item two is uh, the impact on COVID-19 uh, on Audit Scotland's work. Can I welcome Carlin Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland? Uh, Auditor General, we have heard from you both in March and May on the impact of COVID-19 uh, on your work and that of Audit Scotland. Um, as I mentioned on those occasions, your work is intrinsically linked to that of this committee. and As such, it is helpful to receive an update on how Audit Scotland's work is being reshaped due to the current exceptional circumstances and what that means for the committee's own work programme. Carly Garner, can I invite you to make an opening statement? Thank you, convener. Things have moved on since we last discussed the impact of COVID-19 on our work. Scottish ministers have extended the audit timescales for NHS bodies by three months to 30th September, and for local government by two months to 30th November. The deadlines for laying central government and college accounts in the Parliament are unchanged. But audit reporting on central government bodies is likely to be later than in previous years. The format and content of annual reports and accounts have not changed, including full governance statements. But audited bodies do have the option to streamline their performance reporting and management commentaries. We are working closely with audited bodies to complete audit work in line with the new timetables, but at this stage we can't guarantee that we will be able to meet all audit deadlines this year. The work is taking longer, there will be some difficult audit judgments to make, and we will continue to prioritise audit quality and the health of our colleagues. Meanwhile, we will carry out a substantial programme of work to respond to the pandemic. That includes an early review of the Scottish Government's financial response, which we hope to publish in July, and overviews of the NHS and local government responses planned for early 2021. There is more detail in the briefing paper published on Audit Scotland's website to coincide with this meeting, setting out the range of issues we are looking at. As we start to emerge from the pandemic, we are committed to playing our part in recovery and renewal by providing transparency, supporting parliamentary scrutiny and sharing good practice and innovation. Our work is likely to cover how public services are adapting in response to COVID-19, financial sustainability and the impact of increased costs and reduced income, and the economic and fiscal consequences of the pandemic. Convener, as always, I'm happy to answer the committee's questions, and we're also to keen to hear your views. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask Liam Kerr to open up the questioning for the committee. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Auditor General. Uh, in your document that you published in May uh, about how COVID-19 will uh, affect public audit in Scotland, you set out a, a phased approach to your audit work to help Parliament and the public understand how public money is being used through this crisis. Can you just tell us to begin with, what phase have we now reached in that, and what are the next steps as you see it? I think it's clear that we're now through the immediate emergency response to the pandemic, um, and we're seeing a range of both UK and Scottish government programmes in place um, to support the economy and to support individual um, people and families um, across Scotland. Um, the, it's clear that we're now starting to ease out of lockdown with the economy beginning to um, return to something that's more like normal um, and very different views from forecasters and others about how quickly that might happen and how much long-term change there will be. Um, so we're keeping a close eye on all of that. Um, what we're trying to do is to keep in close touch with the government and the other bodies that we audit to make sure we understand um, the responses that they're making, the challenges they're facing, um, and the need for them to have good governance in place um, as they're uh, working in quite unprecedented ways and at unprecedented, unprecedented speed. Um, we, we, as I say, are now focusing on getting the audits of all of those bodies from the Scottish Government through to NHS bodies, councils and others um, complete in line with the revised timetables, and that will provide a lot of assurance. And we have um, reshaped, reprioritised our planned performance audit work um, to make sure that we are responding to what Parliament will need, what this committee will need in carrying out its responsibilities. 
none of us yet knows what the full effect of the pandemic will be or indeed what the full effect on the public finances will be but we are confident we've positioned ourselves to be able to provide you with evidence and assurance about that as we move into the next stage thank you for that now over the last few years this committee's looked at a great many of your uh, very good reports uh, which a lot of the time have suggested that the Scottish Government's promised many things uh, and in those reports the the suggestion has been that perhaps sometimes these things will not be capable of being delivered now I suspect a common refrain following this crisis will be look we could have delivered these things if only coronavirus hadn't happened will your auditors be stress testing that assertion whenever it's made I think uh, I can say with confidence that we will. Um, the, the committee will recall that the last two times I've given evidence to you, it's been on reports where that, that has exactly been the impact. So I reported on affordable housing um, and on early learning and childcare. In both cases, I said there were risks that the government's commitments wouldn't be met by the um, timescales that were expected. Um, and the pandemic made it clear that actually that would not happen. Um, in the case of early learning and childcare, the government has laid regulations to remove the statutory requirement for councils to offer 1140 hours of early learning and childcare to, to eligible children. Part of what we're doing as we reshape the work programme is to make sure that we are coming back at an appropriate point um, to look at what progress has been made, um, to take stock of what the impact of the pandemic was, and to look at um, the way in which government is able to demonstrate um, the value for money that it's providing, but also the way in which its planned outcomes under the National Performance Framework um, are being improved. That's a really key part of our role in supporting your committee to do its work. Thank you for that. Final question from me in this section, convener. Uh, the strength of the UK has resulted in around, I think, £3.8 billion coming to Scotland to address to, to, to directly address the coronavirus emergency. Uh, will your team be auditing and reporting on exactly where that money has gone and where it's been spent so that obviously the public can see that it's gone directly to address the crisis and not perhaps to fill budget gaps elsewhere? That's very much the point of the piece of work um, on the overall financial response by the Scottish Government that we're planning to publish in July. Um, as you say, there's an awful lot of money that has come in um, it, as Barnet, Barnet Consequentials to address the effects of the pandemic. Um, for very good reasons, that money is being spent quickly, it's being passed out to businesses, it's being delivered in the form of, of non-domestic rates relief um, and a range of other ways. Um, it's very important that money does have the uh, impact that it's intended and that it does so quickly. Equally, it's very important that um, your committee and people across Scotland can be assured that it's being spent properly, that the right safeguards are in place and that we can demonstrate what we've got for it. So the piece of work that my colleagues are planning to publish in July um, is very much intended to give you that overall picture, to highlight the specific risks and to identify areas where we think more detailed work might be needed, might be needed in future. Very grateful. Thank you, convener. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Kerry. Can I now hand over to Alex Neal? Thank you, convener. Good morning, Auditor General. Um, can I begin by asking you specifically about the business support measures? Because uh, I haven't heard anything concrete, but I have heard some anecdotal stuff about um, the legitimacy of uh, some of the claims which have been approved. And obviously, I'm not criticising anybody because the whole point was to turn around these applications very quickly to stop companies going bust, etc. But will you be looking into specific cases and doing a sort of sample, uh, for example, of the um, turnaround funds and and things like that, just to ch check that you know large scale systematic fraud uh, involved? I'm not suggesting there is. I'm just saying. If anything, if nothing else, just to reassure people that the money was spent wisely and legitimately. In principle, absolutely yes. Um, as you say, it's very important that this money does get out quickly to the people who um, it's intended to help, um, so that we can protect jobs, livelihoods, businesses for the future. That's that's what it's intended to do. 
and we all know um, as auditors we um, we have seen this in a number of cases in the past when uh, large amounts of funding is available like that and particularly when it's available quickly there is a risk that people will make fraudulent claims or the mistakes will be made um, so the piece of work that's being carried out at the moment is really mapping what each of those funding streams is um, what the controls around them look like and um, whether they look robust enough uh, what checks and balances are in place um, and we'll be reporting all of that i hope uh, by the end of july um, that may reveal some cases where we think there are particular risks that need a much closer look um, and in those instances we've got auditors um, in the government in public bodies around scotland who can go out and do exactly that sort of testing um, to make sure that um, the money is being spent properly and the proper records are kept probably also worth saying that if people do have concerns we're always um, happy we welcome hearing from people if they've got concerns about particular instances that can um, indicate to us there are problems that we should be alert to and we need to do some work on okay thank you and can just arising from that i mean obviously not just the business support money but um, all aspects of dealing financially uh, with the pandemic have obviously had to be de done at speed and in many cases we've been you know inventing new schemes whether it's the furlough scheme or the business support schemes or whatever um, so as part of the will eventually do that once the pandemic is over um, will you be producing some uh, guidelines or a framework for use in any future national crisis such as another pandemic because clearly it seems to me one of the lessons we should all learn from this is we've got to be far better prepared right across the board uh, the next time I mean my understanding is that it's still the case that the number one item on the UK register of risk is the threat of a pandemic and yet if this is the top risk you know the third or fourth risk are we as well prepared for that as we were for the pandemic so in, as part of the exercise and learning lessons which we've all got to do will you be giving some guidance on what lessons need to be learned you're absolutely right um, the purpose of any risk register and um, any risk management process um, is to make sure not only that you know what the risk is but that you have good plans in place um, one of our objectives throughout this is to make sure not only that we're providing your committee with the information you need um, to hold people to account for the way money is being set, spent, services are being provided just now, but also to make sure we are learning lessons, getting good practice out there, as long as that will be happening in real time. Um, we will um, very likely, I think, uh, alongside the formal reporting that we do, be doing much more in the way of using briefings, um, real-time reporting, roundtables, even things like blog posts to get information out quickly to make sure that those lessons are learnt um, as we come out of this phase of the pandemic, but certainly so that they are um, built into any future plans from there. Um, and we're looking to do that in a range of ways. So, for example, one of the things that my colleagues are putting together at the moment um, is guidance for audit committees, um, so that audit committees know what questions to ask about the controls in their own organisation. Um, and thinking about uh, what procurement should look like in an emergency situation. How do you make sure you're buying the PPE, for example, that you need as an, a matter of urgency, but making sure that you're safeguarding public money in doing that? There will be lessons uh, to learn, and we can play a big part in helping to share those and make sure they're baked in for the future. Thank you, Mr. Neil. Do you have a follow up question? I think we might have lost. Mr. Neil, if so, I will move on to Bill Bowman. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Um, can, can I come back to uh, an aspect of how you're doing your work? I, I think we previously asked you about the ability of the auditors to carry out their work remotely, and at that point you said you were uh, that Audit Scotland was still working its way through the, how this might be managed. Can you give us an update on that? Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to, Mr. Bowman. And I think the first thing to say is that we have been um, very pleasantly surprised by how much our audit teams have been able to do remotely. And that applies to um, my colleagues in Audit Scotland and also colleagues in the firms that we appoint to do some of the audits around Scotland. Um, most of us um, 
have been able to uh, move all of our work online practically overnight. I, I was able to give you that assurance about Audit Scotland um, back in March, um, it, and it has continued to be the case that we can work remotely. Um, a lot of the audit work um, is now well underway in line with the plans that the auditive bodies have and the revised timescales. Um, we're expecting at least three audits to be signed off this week, Skills Development Scotland, NHS Orkney and NHS Western Isles. Um, they're the early ones, but others are in the pipeline and expecting to come through. Um, I think it's fair to say that there is more variation among the audited bodies around the extent to which they found it possible to work remotely and to provide the information, explanations, records that auditors need um, to do this. Um, but so far, we've been very pleasantly surprised by how well we've been able to take the work online. And I'm very grateful to all of my colleagues for the efforts they've put in to do that. I should caveat that by saying we know there will be some bodies that will struggle and we know there will be some difficult audit judgments, particularly around things like valuation and verification of physical assets where we haven't yet been tested. Um, but so far, so good. The challenge is that some of the interim work that would normally have been done in March and April, it wasn't possible to do. So um, we've got a, a sort of a, a slight snowplow effect of things moving out towards the later deadlines. Um, but we're managing that in real time, trying to stay agile and flexible um, and to prioritise in ways that keeps the flow of work um, as steady as it can do uh, while protecting our colleagues' health. I know um, external confirmations are a very important part of um, audit work, which is not directly linked to how the audited body is doing its work. Are you finding any difficulty with, I don't know, banks or others giving you direct confirmations? So far not. Um, we've been able to get those confirmations from banks and financial institutions as required. Um, the challenges have been more around things like stock verific verifications, where, as you know, there would often be some physical inspection of significant stocks or stocks that were um, subject to particular um, valuation judgments. We have seen some innovative um, approaches of people effectively taking um, an iPad or an iPhone around with them and, and streaming video, which allowed the auditor to satisfy themselves that the asset was there. People are learning as they go in, in very um, innovative ways. But that's not to say there may not be some stumbling blocks that we can't overcome remotely um, that may lead to delays, depending on where we are in easing out of the lockdown at that point in time. You mentioned um, there about how certain bodies were uh, able to cope with this. Is there a difference between the different type of body? For example, if there's a public body very much connected to, let's say, people, as opposed to those providing a more general service, is, is there a pattern at all? I don't think we've seen a pattern of that sort. I think it's very much more um, how well advanced they were in uh, using digital technology as part of their remote working in general, and particularly how far advanced they were in moving their digital services into the cloud. It's that that's made our services much more robust and resilient than they would have been a couple of years ago. Um, it's enabled people to hold um, online meetings very readily and to have access to all of the records uh, transactions, um, backup documents that they would need to satisfy their auditors. Bodies that have invested in that have been able to move online very smoothly, others are finding it more difficult. And we know some finance departments do have a significant number of staff on site, um, which is a, a challenge and a concern in its own right. And so finally, do you anticipate any serious um, qualifications or modifications in your auditor reports? I'm, I'm not aware of any at this stage. Um, we do know, of course, that, that it's a, a theoretical risk that we're having to plan for. Um, I suspect um, it, the risk is more of um, limitations of scope if we're not able to get information to verify the audit judgments that we need to make um, and would therefore need to limit the scope of the um, audit opinion that we're making on annual reports and accounts. But it is at this stage a risk that we're aware of, rather than one we're actively having to manage at this point. Okay, thank you very much, convener. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. I now hand over to Colin Beattie. Thank you, convener. Morning, uh, Auditor General. Um, when we heard from you in March and May, we discussed the performance audit reports that you were planning to publish and uh, what might happen to them. Can you update the committee on the approach? you're taking to this, and what discussions have you held with the relevant public bodies? 
Certainly. Um, what the team have been doing is to um, step back and look at what's already in the performance audit programme um, and uh, make a judgment to uh, propose to the Accounts Commission and the new Auditor General about the priority they should take in future. Um, so, for example, the Educational Outcomes Audit, uh, which was on the stocks we were already working on um, in March, um, it's very clear that will be just as relevant, if not more so, um, as we come out of the pandemic as it was before. Um, the team are engaging with colleagues in Scottish Government about um, what the right questions are to ask now, what actions the government is taking, and therefore what role audit can usefully play. And we'll pick that up again um, so that the work continues through 2021 and can provide a picture of not just the progress the government was making on increasing educational outcomes, and reducing the attainment gap, but how that's been affected by the pandemic. Um, in other instances, we are looking at new pieces of work which um, have now become much more important because of the pandemic. Um, and for example, as part of that, the economic interventions um, which the government was expecting to make that we heard a lot about in the report of the um, Economic Recovery Advisory Group earlier this week um, is likely we'll be planning to do some work looking at the way those decisions are being made and the trade-offs between um, investing in different types of companies versus the government's aspirations to renew the economy in the longer term. So some pieces of work will simply need a bit of refreshing and, and relaunching, others will be new pieces of work that come into the programme and some will drop out because they simply don't seem that important after the things we've been through over the last three months. Just out of interest, have any public bodies uh, said to you, you know, get, we're, we're so busy at the moment, give us a bit of space and uh, you know, we, we we can't commit resources to supporting an audit at this time. Have you had that at all? Um, the expectation that they might do that was very much why we paused the performance audit program in March when we all went home. Um, we absolutely recognised that audit was unlikely to be anybody's number one priority at that stage, so we pulled out of that planned work um, and took the time to review the program. Um, since then, actually, as I said in response to Mr Bowman's question, we've been surprised by how ready and able people are to engage with us on all of the audit work, and we appreciate that very much. Um, we are still working through, though, for example, on the piece of work that I mentioned in July about the government's financial response. Um, we need to make sure that the government is willing to commit the time to clear the factual content of that in a normal way, um, and that the timescales that we have in place are appropriate to provide assurance to Parliament during the um, slightly odd recess you're having this year, um, while not placing unreasonable demands on our colleagues in the Scottish Government and other public bodies. And that will continue, I think, to flex over time, uh, but we um, are clear that accountability and good governance is more important than ever, and therefore um, we will have expectations that um, the government and other public bodies will engage with us when that's appropriate. Now, we also discussed Audit Scotland's work programme in, in a more general way and how this might change as a, as a consequence of COVID-19. Can you update the committee on what stage you've reached in this and what discussions you've had with Audit Scotland staff and your successor on the approach that might be appropriate to take in the longer term in the planning of reports? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of that question, Mr Beattie. Would you mind just repeating it very yeah, briefly? Of course. Uh, we have discussed that uh, about Audit Scotland's work programme in a general sense and how this might change as a consequence of COVID-19. And I was asking whether you could update the committee on what stage you'd reached in that. And I think you got the rest of it. I did. Thank you very much. Um, yes, the, uh, the, the work programme, um, as you know, is formally agreed by the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission to make sure that it's a joined up piece of work which covers all public spending, all public services. The intention at the moment is that a revised programme will be approved by uh, the Commission and by, by my successor, Stephen Boyle, in September of this year. Um, but we're obviously not holding off doing work on the response to the pandemic until then. Um, so the um, work that's going on at the moment is very much about monitoring what's happening in government and other public bodies, making sure we, we're cited on um, where the risks are, where there's value that audit can add. Um, and on producing almost real-time outputs like the one planned for July on the financial response, uh, questions for audit committees, red flags on procurement, for example. Uh, but September will be the milestone for um, formally agreeing the programme, and obviously that ties into Audit Scotland's budget cycle for 2021-22. 20, 
And I think probably the committee would be quite concerned to know that where we've been receiving Section 22 reports, that there's going to be proper follow-up in that, and there's going to be a prioritisation of that, because especially during this this time with COVID-19 and the pressures, both financial and uh, manpower and so on, that's being put on the public services, is it is it uh, absolutely within your uh, programme that you'll be focusing on these weak points? Very much so. Um, Section 22 reports are the main vehicle by which um, I, as Auditor General and my successor, can report to, to Parliament, to your committee, um, about matters of public interest coming out of the annual audit work. Um, I said in my opening remarks that the deadlines for laying reports in um, from central government bodies um, in Parliament hasn't changed. It will be by the end of December. NHS audits are due to be complete now by the 30th of September. Um, and we will make do our best to hit those deadlines. But um, if anything slips, it will be the timing, not the content. If there are issues that we think needs to come to Parliament, we'll make sure they're fully reported in the usual way and that the committee is fully supported to explore them. The overview reports on the NHS um, and colleges provide an opportunity to step back and look at common themes that are coming through and the commitment to an annual Section 22 report on the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts um, remains in place, so you will receive all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Beatty. Before I hand over to uh, Neil Bibby, <clears throat> Order General, you mentioned uh, procurement. As part of the, the work that we'll be doing in the next phase, will you be looking at our procurement structures in particular? Because obviously we've there's been a lot of procurement, PPE being one prime example of that uh, through this crisis. Will there be a specific look at procurement practices and any lessons we can learn in the future? Um, it will certainly be one of the risks that auditors are looking at in their audits of 20, uh, 2021. Um, most of that procurement will have happened in the current financial year, um, and auditors are very alive to the risks of making large purchases like that um, it, at short order um, with new suppliers in, in many cases, so they'll be looking at it. Um, in general terms, we'll report if there's something useful to report to you, either lessons learned or problems that have been uncovered, um, but it absolutely is one of the risks that we're all conscious of as we're going through this emergency period. Um, and Indeed, as we uh, move into the next stage and are thinking about what's required as public services start to adapt and renew themselves for the future. Um, but it, it will be a big area of focus for us. It will, it will be a specific piece of work, though, looking at procurement around PPE, etc. Um, I don't want to um, commit uh, Stephen Ball as my successor to that at this stage, but I will absolutely give you that assurance that as we're mapping out where we can best use the audit resources available make, and prioritise between them, procurement is right up there as an area that we're conscious of. Um, and it may well be picked up as part of the um, the overview reporting on the Scottish Government and on the NHS in particular, that always comes out of this year's um, audited accounts. Thank you. I'll hand over to Neil Bibby. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, Auditor General. Um, the, the biggest failure in this crisis has been in the care sector, uh, specifically in care homes. Um, we've seen issues about patients being discharged. Uh, without testing and, and preparedness issues in our care homes. What can all the Scotland do to shine a light on the significant failures that we've seen in the co uh, in the care sector during COVID-19? I, I think there are two things I can um, give you assurance about, Mr Bibby. Um, the first is I mentioned that the NHS overview, which we produce annually, looking at the health and care system, um, will be expanded to look at the um, effects of the pandemic and the way in which the NHS and social care responded to it. Um, and the questions that you raise will certainly be part of that. Um, we're planning to push back the timing a little bit to allow more time both for the NHS audits being um, completed later, but also for work on those wider questions to be picked up. Um, we also had in the programme, uh, before we went into the pandemic, a significant piece of work um, just getting underway on social care. Um, and that's another one of the, the um, audits, like the Audit of Educational Outcomes, that has really gone up um, the priority order, given everything we've seen over the last few months. Um, and I think there are important questions there about how we make sure that the social care system is fit for purpose, um, that it is much better linked in to um, the NHS, 
and that the integration authorities are able to do their work of um, really making sure that services are designed around people and their needs rather than expecting people to fit in with services that operate in, in, in separate silos. Um, so two big pieces of work underway that I think will help to shine some light on those really important questions that you raise. Thanks, Auditor General. Thanks, Camina. Uh, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, Auditor General. Um, Liam Kerr and uh, his questions there uh, raised the query about the strength of the UK funding the borrowing campaign. Um, a bit of a rascal question there from a colleague, but um, I wanted to, uh, to make the point that any money that comes to Scotland, of course, is Scottish taxpayers' money coming back to where it should be. But that's a political point that I wouldn't expect you to respond to. But what I did want to ask you was, who audits this process, Auditor General, when the UK or any government indeed borrows these amounts of money in the international market? Who audits that? And who is it that casts an eye over that to make sure that Scotland gets its fair share of the monies that are being borrowed on our behalf? Uh, you know, Mr Coffey, that um, I um, take great care not to get involved in the political questions. Our value of being independent and non-partisan. Um, I'm responsible for auditing the money which either comes to the Scottish Government as funding from the UK Government or which is raised directly here in taxation of various forms. Um, my colleague, the Comptroller and Auditor General and the National Audit Office play the same role at a UK level. Um, and um, as the committee knows, over recent years, we've worked very closely together um, as the, uh, the, the lines that set out the devolution settlement have got more blurred over the last five years or so since uh, the Scottish Parliament's, Parliament's financial powers have been raised um, significantly. Um, we aim to set out as clearly as we can the Scottish Government's um, overall financial picture, and we may talk about that later this morning. Um, the National Audit Office does the same for the UK's whole of government accounts, so that, that picture is there. Um, and we have been working together and talking to you, to the Finance Committee and to the UK Parliament, um, about the need for uh, more clarity around parts of the fiscal, frame, fiscal framework, like the way uh, Barnet consequentials flow through, um, and the clarity about which, which subject, which increases in funding are subject to Barnet consequentials and which aren't. We've seen some confusion about that over the last few weeks. That doesn't help the government to plan, and it doesn't help to build confidence um, that the system is working well. So I'd, I'd certainly be in favour of more transparency at the intergovernmental intergovernment, inter level about how that's working. Mm -hmm. are, are you seeing, basically, seeing that governments across the world are essentially borrowing their way out of this crisis? Is that just happening right across the world, and, and presumably? Clearly, that has to be paid back in some form or another over over time. So, it, when a pandemic, a pandemic like this, a health emergency occurs anywhere, is, it, is this the solution? The only solution that's at our hands is to borrow our way out of this. I think, uh, as you say, this is a global pandemic that has hit countries across the world in ways that none of us could have predicted in terms of the specific effect it's had. Um, and we have seen governments responding in ways that are quite unprecedented in terms of the um, amount of support they're providing to businesses, to families and individuals, to the way public services have um, pivoted to, to meet really um, critical, uh, particularly health and social care needs. Um, the uh, only way to fund that in the short term is to borrow, and governments are in a very, very pr privileged position to do that. Um, I think it's shown the value of um, government um, that maybe has come under um, pressure over the last 20 years um, as market solutions have become more popular and more prominent. I think this has reminded us all that there are some things that only governments can do, and we will have to turn attention in due course to how that borrowing is repaid. Um, as you said earlier, um, most of this at the moment is UK um, borrowing simply because that's where the power to borrow sits. The Scottish Government doesn't have power to borrow on that scale at all. Um, the UK government will have to make choices about whether it wants to um, return to austerity, um, to raise taxes, or to accept that having a high level of government debt um, in some circumstances isn't the, the, the worst way forward. Um, I said elsewhere that, in my personal view, I think at this point, um, cutting public services, um, cutting public spending would be um, 
it would have a very unfortunate effect in terms of adding to the economic shock that all of this is causing, uh, but they really are political questions um, that um, there, there are people in better suited positions than, than me to make decisions on. Um, for me, the question is being very clear about the longer term impact um, and the choices that are involved in terms of both raising taxes and uh, spending on public services so that we can have a democratic debate about it. Okay, um, thank you. Last question from me, Annis. Um, just looking at your own Audit, Audit Scotland's work over the coming uh, years, Auditor General, there, we're all talking about new, new ways of working. Uh, many more people are, are now able to work from home, and it's providing some benefits, isn't it? How, how will that impact on Audit Scotland's ability to, kind of, to audit these processes if a, if a continuing number of people are essentially working from home? Will you be able to adapt and modify your program to try to take that into account as best you can? I, I think we're in the middle of doing it, Mr. Coffey. Um, as I said, we've we've surprised ourselves really by how much audit work we are able to do this year remotely, both because our staff are work, working remotely and because the, the bodies that we audit are doing so. Um, there will be some positive things that we want to take out of this experience. Um, we already um, build a lot of flexibility into the ways our colleagues can work. This has shown that we can take it to a whole new level. Equally, there are some people who very much value being able to come to the office some of the time. And we know that colleagues need to spend time together. Um, part of the, the value of work is that sort of informal cross fertilization and just the pleasure of being together with colleagues. Um, so we're learning as we go, the bodies that we audit are, and um, it probably goes without saying that those sorts of shifts are likely to lead to changes in the patterns of expenditure that we audit. There may well be less demand for office buildings and more demand for technology in future, and they change the sorts of internal controls and safeguards that we need to have in place to make sure that public money is being spent well and that the um, records and accounts are being kept properly. Um, so we're, we're learning fast. and. Um, as always, with these um, very difficult situations, there are opportunities as well as real losses that we'll be dealing with. Do you think those changes are here to stay, or will we revert back? Do you think will we tend to revert back to the old ways of working where uh, everybody piles into an office to carry out their work? Do you think the changes, these positive changes, are here to stay for a, a while yet? You know? I'm sure some of them are here to stay. Um, so within Audit Scotland, we've already made the decision that our planning in future is digital first, rather than being an office-based organisation. Um, we will be a, a digitally enabled organisation, and we will need some space for our staff to come together, um, for, for people who've got caring responsibilities to work in a focused way away from the home, um, for people to be able to um, share expertise and build relationships in ways that are quite hard to do when you're looking at each other through a screen like this. Um, so the changes will be there. I think we're just not sure yet um, how how much of a change is permanent and how much of a, a sort of revert, reversion to the way we were before that we and other public bodies will need to put in place. And I think businesses right across the economy are grappling with the same questions just now. Okay. Thanks for that, Caroline. Thank you, Kimina. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Uh, I see that we have Mr. Neil back, so I'm going to hand back to uh, Alec Neil to complete his questions. I'm afraid we do, Mr. Neil. If we pause for a moment, and we'll try again, Mr. Neil. We can hear you that time. I'm sorry, we still can't hear you, Mr. Neil. So we're going to have to try and resolve your issues. You may need to unmute yourself. Have you unmuted yourself, Mr. Neil? I think we'll we'll move on. If we can get Mr. Neil back in on the next session, I uh, I can take those questions then. Um, unless Mr. Neil wants to try one last time, if we can hear his voice. Nope. Um, I apologise, Mr. Neil. We'll need to take you in the next session. Um, thank you very much, Auditor General, um, for the evidence in the first part of this session. Um, I'm now going to move on to item number three, which is the key audit themes. Um, Auditor General, this is your final appearance before the committee. Uh, we wanted to provide you with an opportunity to reflect on your time in office, to talk about the key uh, issues and themes that keep arising audit report uh, and where developments have been made and where you think further progress is required. Um, as you know, over the last few years, the committee has increasingly taken a strategic approach to its scrutiny. 
publishing our sport last year, which drew together key teams and which explicitly recognised that many of the issues that are highlighted in the new audit reports are as a consequence of pressures on public. We look forward to hearing your views today. And I invite you to make an opening uh, statement, and then I'll open it out to members. Thank you, convener, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity um, to open out my scope um, in this way on my final appearance before you. Um, as I finish my term of office, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic can feel overwhelming. Um, but as you say, many of the issues that I've reported on over the last eight years are as important as ever. So I'd like to step back and highlight three themes. First of all, COVID-19 has shown us many of the strengths of Scottish society. Um, the responsiveness and resilience of our public services and the way individuals and communities have supported each other show that we've got a lot to be proud of. But the pandemic does also risk obscuring some long-standing issues that we need to address as we move towards recovery and renewal. In particular, COVID-19 has highlighted the deep-seated inequalities in Scottish society. Despite the commitments made by all political parties since the establishment of the Parliament, COVID-19 has shown how the cards remain stacked against the poorest and most vulnerable in society and how they suffer disproportionately during times of crisis. The Scottish Government's National Performance Framework is an ambitious attempt to join up policy making and focus on outcomes like reducing poverty, stimulating economic growth and tackling climate change. The framework was groundbreaking, but 13 years after it was launched, it's still difficult to see how individual policies and budgets are designed to improve outcomes or how trade-offs between, for example, tackling climate change and supporting the economy are managed. In order to make a greener, fairer and more prosperous Scotland a reality, the government will need to be more focused in setting its policies and directing its resources, underpinned by better data. The committee has seen many examples of the way a lack of data, for example, on primary care and mental health services, gets in the way of shaping services to meet people's needs. And we also need more parliamentary scrutiny of the government's plans, budgets and progress in tackling the long-standing challenges we face as a nation. Second, one of the defining features of my time as AGS is the big increase in the Scottish Parliament's financial powers. We now raise directly around 40% of what we spend, with borrowing and reserve powers providing some short-term flexibility. But the limits of the fiscal framework mean it will be difficult for the Scottish Government to balance, balance its spending against the available funding this year and in future years. Maintaining that critical financial stability will require greater financial transparency, and I'll highlight two priorities. First of all, a set of consolidated public sector accounts that sets out what the government owns and what it owes, as well as what it raises and what it spends, is essential to underpin good decisions and effective scrutiny. And secondly, transparency about the medium-term financial strategy is also critical. Before the pandemic, the strategy offered little information on the government's spending plans and no consideration of how a £1 billion budget shortfall over the next three years would be addressed. The pandemic has made those pressures much more acute. We need to know what the budget is likely to look like in the years ahead and how the government intends to fund its priorities. The new budget process has been slowly bedding in, but we're now at a pivotal moment. Um, and I really want to stress this isn't just a technocratic issue. Governments, as we were saying a moment ago, are protecting lives and livelihoods in ways that would have seemed unthinkable even six months ago. And as we emerge from the pandemic, the Scottish Parliament will need to base its decisions on clear, comprehensive and reliable information about the spending choices available and what they're intended to achieve. And then the third area I want to focus on is, again, something we touched on earlier, renewing the NHS and social care. Our NHS has been a rallying point during the pandemic, but the tremendous speed and scale of its response risks obscuring the fact that it's not sustainable in its current form. Since the NHS was established, society has changed dramatically. We live much longer and we increasingly suffer from chronic diseases like diabetes and dementia that can't be fixed during a hospital stay. It doesn't make sense to keep pouring money into a system that was designed for a different era. Health no. has increasingly struggled to break even, and when I last reported, if you can please mute yourself, Mr. Neil. Sorry, Order General, if you can continue. 
when I last reported, health accounted for 42% of the Scottish budget no, and rising. No, no, no. My microphone that is unmuted. That can't continue indefinitely without consequences for other public services like education. We've seen the unintended effects of looking at individual parts of the health and care system in isolation. Now we need to start seeing the system as a whole and removing the barriers to change. Progress with integration has been limited so far, and we need to look again at the incentives in the system, rewarding people for working together rather than for the performance of their individual silos. And we also urgently need to shape a culture that gives leaders the space to lead every day rather than just when there's a crisis and that puts trust and kindness at the centre. Finally, convener, I'd like to close by touching on the role of this committee. In the Parliament's first decade, its committees were seen as one of the successes of devolution, but that view was challenged by the Commission on Parliamentary Reform, which found that they've not been as effective as the Constitutional Steering Group hoped in holding government to account. The Commission made a number of recommendations for change, some of which have been taken forward, but I believe there's also scope for the Public Audit Committee to play a stronger role in scrutinising government spending and that Audit Scotland can help you. We were created alongside the Parliament to provide you with independent evidence to hold people to account for the way they spend public money. As Auditor General, I'm appointed and nominated by the Parliament, and I can only be dismissed by a parliamentary vote. And I'm accountable for my budget to a commission shared by Colin Beattie. Those safeguards are all there for a reason, to protect our independence and enable us to produce reports that the committee can rely on. That's a privileged position and we take it very seriously, investing in the quality of our work, agreeing the factual content of our reports, and communicating our findings clearly in a fair and balanced way. But it sometimes feels that the committee's scrutiny can be directed at our work rather than at the people in government and other public bodies who are accountable for what we found. That reflects the polarised political environment we all work in, but it can limit the committee's effectiveness. And when the committee takes evidence from accountable officers, you're sometimes hampered by not knowing how to interpret the evidence you're given or how to probe the answers you receive. Audit Scotland could help you to strengthen your scrutiny, acting as trusted advisors rather than just another set of witnesses, in line with well-established practices in Westminster, Cardiff and Belfast. The pandemic and a change of Auditor General offers the chance to look again at your working practices at a time when your scrutiny role has never been more important. And I've got no doubt that you'll be, be in excellent hands as Stephen Boyle takes over on the 1st of July. Convener, I've covered a lot of ground, but I hope I've left you with some food for thought as I step down after eight tremendously privileged years as a Scottish Parliament's Auditor General. Delivering the changes needed won't be straightforward. It's much easier to score points than to engage in a debate about what's important and what trade-offs are involved. All political parties recognise these challenges and all find it difficult to deal with them in office. So we need to address them together as a parliament and as a nation. I'll finish with a question, if I may. We all find ourselves at a watershed moment. How do we want to use it? Thank you, convener. Thank you so much, Auditor General, um, for that uh, opening statement. There is there's so much uh, in that, but I, I don't want to uh, hog all the questions myself. So I will uh, put out to other members of the committee at any moment. And I, I think a lot of the issues that you have raised. I think are important connections that we as individual committee members, we as a collective as a committee, but also we as a parliament uh, need to reflect uh, on, and particularly as we head into the, the next parliament session uh, and what that means for the future of, of our country and our public services in the country. You touched on, I want to just uh, touch upon two things that you mentioned before I hand over to Colin Beattie. The first one you mentioned was around uh, NHS and social care. And I, I think there is certainly a uh, more than just a debate that needs to be had, actually decisions need to be made uh, around the future model of care and how we deliver that care uh, for people right across uh, the country. But one of the things that hampers us uh, out with just the politics, but one of the things that structurally hampers us uh, in our NHS and social care, but actually in, in almost every area that you audit, is we have a people problem. And we have a people problem in terms of numbers. And we have a people problem in terms of adequate training places, we have a people problem in terms of adequate training, and then we have a people problem in terms of actually recruiting, uh, nurturing, uh, and expanding our workforces. And any reflections on on those people challenges that we have uh, and how we can go about responding to them? Some of it is immigration, some of it is training within uh, our country itself, 
done with it as redesign. But any reflections on that? Um, as you say, convener, there's a huge amount in there, and we have published reports um, on uh, the workforce challenges, specifically in NHS and social care, um, which highlight some of the, the challenges um, and some of the potential solutions. Um, I think the, the couple of things I'd highlight just now are, first of all, the need for a vision um, of what health and social care should look like to meet the needs of Scotland's people in the 21st century. Um, the 2020 vision uh, was set out 10 years ago. We're in 2020 now, and um, I think it's widely acknowledged that not enough progress has been made on really moving away to a service which is delivered much closer to people's homes, is much more centred around their individual needs, and is about keeping people well in the face of um, chronic ill health rather than uh, the sorts of um, conditions or diseases that can be treated and cured and people re return to, to life as it was before. Um, in my last NHS overview report, I highlighted the need for a fresh vision, one which really does engage the people who work in, in health and care, people across Scotland, politicians of all parties in thinking about the choices we face and why we may need to move away from what many of us still instinctively think of as being um, the NHS. And that's been reinforced by the pandemic with all the fantastic work that's been going on in intensive care units. That matters, but most of what health services do most of the time is, is much less glamorous than that, but just as important in giving people the chance to live full and long lives. Um, so I think the vision really matters. Um, and then, as you say, um, a focused programme of work that, that starts to, to think through what does that mean for the professionals we need? Um, how do we train them ourselves? How do we retain people who are already in, in work um, in health and care? I talk to a lot of doctors and nurses and other people who work in health and care services um, across the, the um, year in normal times. And all of those people um, joined because they want to make a difference to people's lives and they're often frustrated by the sorts of systems that they have to work within, the culture that they work in and the ways in which they're held to account. So the, the, um, the focus on waiting times to the exclusion of many other things. Um, I think that ability to set up a culture which gives professionals um, room to do their jobs, to do them in the way they want to with care and kindness for individuals, um, while holding them to account for the, the big picture um, results that the system achieves, would go a long way to addressing the workforce problems and keeping people in their jobs longer um, so, that, so that their experience and expertise, um, we make the most of it and we pass it on to the next generation of uh, professionals and care workers coming through. Well, General, you, you've been in this role for, for eight years and uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to get involved in, and you are way too clever and smart and well trained now in, in not getting involved in the political disputes that Willie Coffey and Liam Kerr might want us to get into every now and then. Um, but I think there is a there is an issue you mentioned there about culture. Um, have you seen a sense of, and this is for the wider political establishment, for all political parties I'm, I'm questioning here, have you seen a culture of the polarisation in our politics hamper and undermine that approach of trying to reform our services here in Scotland? If I'm honest, I do. Um, I've had the experience more than once where um, I, I've published my report on the NHS, for example. Um, I've been in the BBC studio in Edinburgh to talk about it on GMS. Um, I then come into the garden lobby before your committee meets on a Thursday morning, um, and an opposition member will come up to me and say, we completely agree with what you're saying, but we can never say that in the chamber. Now, I, I absolutely get the, the um, pressures there are on all political parties um, to make those short term points and to open up space between themselves and the government. But equally, people recognise that they would have to deal with those challenges themselves in power. Um, and all we're doing is, is pushing them further and further into the future um, and making the pressures more intense. I absolutely don't underplay the difficulties um, of uh, any individual politician or party moving away from that. And in a sense, complaining about politics feels like complaining about the weather. It just is the environment we have to work in. But there is, I think, something um, really important at this moment, particularly about recognising that, that these are challenges that won't be addressed unless we can find a way of talking together about some of the big choices we face and the sort of society that we want to be in future. Um, the pandemic's opened up an awful lot of um, stress lines in society. Would you really said that, that both opposition and government members that can, that can do better than that? 
absolutely the case, I think, yes. I think one of the one of the lessons of the pandemic, particularly at the start of the pandemic, I, I think we did see Scotland's political Scotland's political society rally together in the face of the pandemic at the start. And it still seems that we've returned or are returning to politics as usual. Do you think some of that spirit that we displayed as a country at the start of this pandemic could be a spirit that we could display in terms of the public services going forward? I very much hope so. I mean, we all know that this pandemic has, has imposed huge costs on people, families, communities right across the country. The economic cost, cost to a great extent is still to come. It would be even more tragic if we couldn't take some benefits from that. Um, I think that, um, for example, the approach that the First Minister has taken to communicating um, about what's happening in Scotland, about the route out of lockdown, about the choices that are having to be made within that has really been exemplary. Um, there will be lessons learned. We all recognise that. Um, but I think to be um, starting off in the spirit that this was something that none of us have had to do, had to do with in our lifetimes, it demanded an absolutely instant response um, to things which were unprecedented um, and that some things will have been done wrong as well as many things being done right. Um, going into um, inquiries and lessons learned with that spirit could go a long way to starting to rebuild um, a conversation that's about what do we learn from this rather than who's to blame. Thank you. And, and final question from me, um, Audrey Jam, before I hand over to Colin Beatty. Um, last week at the um, Commission, um, I asked you about um, auditing of uh, race disparity in Scotland. Um, and this is a request I've been making of the government now for two years to do a, a race disparity audit uh, in Scotland, but it's something that they have been hesitant to do so far. Is that something that Audit Scotland will consider doing so we can take the issue of equality much more seriously and know what our baseline is in terms of building a more progressive and equal Scotland? I absolutely recognise the importance of um, equalities in the broader sense. And I think, again, it's, it's one of the answers to your question earlier about our people problem for health and care and other public services, making sure that everybody has the chance to thrive and to fulfil their potential, whatever disadvantages they're facing. Um, as I said when we met with the Commission last week, it's not our core area of responsibility, but we do some work in this area. So all auditors have been asked to look at equalities arrangements this year as part of our duties under the equalities legislation. Um, we'll be asking the government um, about that as part of that wider pattern of work. Um, and if there is more work to be done, um, then I think it's a conversation that we would like to have with you and with government. Um, and it may be something that comes through the Section 22 reporting on the Scottish Government accounts this year that will provide you with a hook to ask the Permanent Secretary about it um, and to get more clarity about their plans for providing exactly that sort of baseline information that would let us um, track progress uh, with the Government's commitments around becoming a, a fairer um, country as we emerge from the pandemic. But I, I know Stephen Bowe will be happy to continue that conversation with you. But you have no objection in principle to doing a race disparity audit in Scotland? Um, it's, it's not an objection in principle. It's more um, a question of making sure that we make best use of our skills and resources and that we are um, keeping the responsibility where it sits with government and the equalities bodies. But I think there are things that Audit Scotland and the Auditor General can do um, to um, help the committee um, engage with government about its plans and potentially to fill some of the gaps where information is available to report that clearly and to highlight where information is not available so that you can ask the questions about um, why it's not there and when it will be filled. Thank you, Dr. General. I'll now hand over to Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mina. Um, Dr. General, thank you for your insights there. There's clearly a, a lot of challenges for all of us going forward. I would like to return to one theme which I have raised with you on quite a number of occasions, which is internal audit. During your time in office, we have had many, many reports, Section 22 reports, uh, which have indicated that there has been financial problems or whatever within a particular uh, public sector body, and uh, that the internal audit have carried out their duties absolutely perfectly in accordance with contract, 
but still something slides through and goes wrong, and we end up, as I say, with a Section 22 report. Is internal audit, as it's developed, particularly in recent years, fit for purpose? I think it's not possible to give you a, a one-word answer on that. Um, we see some public bodies where internal audit is um, extremely effective. It's highly valued by those charged with governance by the audit committee. It plans its work well, carries it out well, and its recommendations are taken into account, and it's effective in that sense. We see some public bodies where um, internal audit isn't well enough resourced or doesn't meet the internal audit standards in carrying out its work, and where that's the case, we report on it. Um, and there are um, cases in the middle where internal audit does everything which is expected of it, uh, but because it can't look at every transaction or every system every year, or because the um, people on the audit committee aren't paying attention to its recommendations, problems still emerge. I think the only assurance I can give you is that it's something that external auditors look at every year as part of their overall work on the system of internal control within, within an organisation. Um, we do report where we see problems, and you'll recall that that was um, a feature of last year's Section 22 report on the Scottish Government audit, that progress had been made with internal audit, um, and we thought there was scope for the audit committee to be more effective in asking for it. Um, but no form of audit is a guarantee that nothing will go wrong. Um, that's been the subject of a lot of debate over the last couple of years with reviews from Kingman and the CMA um, and the Bryden Review more recently. Um, it, I think continuing that conversation about what external audit and what internal audit do is very important um, so that they're um, understood and given their place. But at the end of the day, it is management that's responsible for um, its systems of control and its financial reporting. Um, and we uh, try to make sure that responsibility stays where it belongs. I fully accept that internal audit is only as good as the, the people who are uh, involved in it. And it is a partnership between the internal audit team and the board or whoever is doing the monitoring uh, or, the, or receiving the reports. However, do, do you think that over the years where internal audit has actually become contracted out to third parties, where not unnaturally there is a fixed program of boxes to tick? With very little, with, with apparently very little leeway, because obviously for contractual legal reasons and so on, they're not going to do more or less than those boxes say that they've got to do. Is is that constraining internal audit? Is that is that is 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 that a straitjacket, which means that internal audit are not as wide looking? I'll use that as a, as a word. They have such a broad vision of the business that they're auditing. I think it, I think it can be a risk, and we, we do see that where internal auditors um, are um, appointed from one of the firms who specialise in that work, um, particularly I think where they're newly appointed and where the audit committee isn't particularly effective, the um, internal audit plan. Um, may not focus on the most important issues, and nobody may pick that up, neither the audit committee nor the internal auditors themselves. Equally, though, I've seen some really strong examples of um, contracted out internal audit, and I pick out the example of the Scottish Police Authority, um, where Scott Moncrief have been the internal auditors um, since the SPA put in place internal audit, which was later than it should have been. Um, but they've done an outstanding job in um, getting a real sense of uh, not just what the internal controls look like, but what the culture is within the SPA and Police Scotland, what that means for the risks that the organisation faces, and therefore what internal audit work they should be carrying out. Um, so again, um, I, I, there is a risk, uh, but it's not as straightforward as saying having an in-house internal audit service is always better. We've seen some cases where that absolutely isn't the case, although there are some great um, in-house services around as well. I know in the past I've uh, asked you the level to which you get involved in uh, defining internal audit within the various organisations, and I know that every every public sector body is different to an extent, uh, the risks it faces and so forth. Is it possible to have, if you like, a manual so that 
internal audit and management have guidelines which they can look at without without it being too constrained. You don't want the manual itself to become a tick box, but that we give some guidance as to the ideals of internal audit and the relationship with the body being audited. There is already a significant amount of guidance out there from the internal auditing standards that internal auditors are required to um, adhere to and indeed to be assessed independently every few years to, to demonstrate they're meeting that. Um, there is also audit committee guidance produced by the Scottish Government for public bodies. Um, and uh, external auditors every year as part of their work on the overall control system will have a look at the quality of internal audit and decide how much of their work they can rely on. Um, I think in many ways the answer comes back to something which your committee has also repeatedly asked about, which is really making sure you have got a good um, audit committee with independent members who understand the business well, who understand what the role of internal and external audit is as well and are asking the right questions, are asking why particular things aren't on the plan, are testing the priority of different pieces of work that the internal auditors could do and are really making sure that their findings are taken seriously. Um, you'll recall that when we were reporting on NHS Tayside, internal audit had tried to blow the whistle about um, the uh, transaction with the endowment fund um, and nobody wanted to hear that. Um, so that it, to me it comes down at the end of the day probably more to culture than to the existence of standards and guidance. I think you did touch on uh, one point there though, which is the question of whether internal audit is a passive function or a proactive function. And you might think it's audit, therefore it is passive in a way, but it shouldn't be. But how do you how do you get over to these internal audit units the fact that they need to be proactive, that they need to have that vision? and not necessarily, if they find an issue, be bound by the box ticking? I think most of them already understand that and the best of them, at some personal cost, will um, step beyond either the box ticking or what they're subliminally being told is wanted by the organisation that they work for. Um, and I think this committee plays a really important role in reinforcing that, that internal audit needs to be independent, that that's the value it brings to be testing and challenging the received wisdom within an organisation and really providing evidence that what people say should be happening is happening in practice. Um, and we will continue to report to the committee where we see internal audit that's not as effective as it needs to be. Um, but it, 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 it's Internal audit is a key part of the system of governance and in internal control. Um, I think it's hard to, to say it's the um, it's the one which is most responsible when things go wrong. The whole system needs to work well, and we've seen internal audit absolutely playing its part in that, as well as people not living up to the standards expected of them. Thank you for that, Audit General. You you can relax now. Or you won't be getting hassled about internal audit again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucy. And I hope you get the chance to talk to their conference next year as planned. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucy. And I hand over to Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning again, Auditor General. Uh, a, a different key theme uh, from me, but one that I'm sure you will expect. Uh, your reports have looked many times at severance payments uh, made to particularly senior departing individuals. Uh, now, the committee has raised its concerns, uh, and perhaps some might say you have raised concerns in your reports, uh, that sometimes these payments seem somewhat inflated and perhaps don't represent uh, value to the public pound. Uh, but nothing ever seems to change. Uh, do you get any sense that we are going to make any headway on this to, to ensure that public money will be being spent at levels which the public will feel are appropriate? I think it's a really important question. Um, I've said to the committee before, there can be an important role for severance payments. You can genuinely make long-term savings, reshape organisations in ways that improve things for the public by making one-off severance payment to somebody and being able to um, either delete a post or uh, recruit people at lower paid roles that are more um, suited to what needs to be done. So there's a place for them, no doubt. Um, equally, particularly when you're talking about senior people, the amounts involved can be significant. 
um, and they look very significant when you um, are comparing them to the, um, the salaries of people we've all come to recognise as being key workers over the last three months. So it's critical that people have got confidence that decisions are being made well, that the people making those decisions are accountable, and that the benefits that are intended are actually being achieved. Um, it's probably worth reminding the committee that when I report to you, it tends to be because things have gone wrong, um, that there are um, severance payments made in organisations around the country every year that are absolutely above board in the ways that I've described. And there's a good deal of um, transparency around them now. They are included in the um, annual reports and accounts, the auditor sections of those annual reports um, that the public bodies publish. Um, and uh, the um, transparency in terms of the money involved, the people who received them was much greater than it was. Um, I think I, I would say also the committee has had an impact here because of the attention you've paid to this issue over the years. Um, as you know, the Scottish Government now takes a role itself in approving and signing off settlements um, above a certain level of payment. Um, and there is a cap um, UK wide on the amount that can be paid um, in the circumstances of um, redundancy or um, early retirement. All of that, I think, is an improvement in ensuring that there's transparency and value for money around it. And I think the committee can be proud of the impact that it's had. Equally, I know that over the time that I've been in this job, I've reported on some really um, unacceptable cases of severance payments where the decision making just wasn't good enough and the checks and balances didn't operate. And that's the sort of thing that really does undermine public trust and confidence in public bodies um, and makes it more difficult to manage the workforce in the ways that we should want it to be managed looking ahead. Thank you for that. I think it's a very reassuring answer, if I may say so, and uh, I think a fair answer, given that I, you know, I posed the question, are we going to make any headway on this? And I think really what I'm hearing, if I might reflect back, is uh, that you would say we are making headway, that actually there have been some improvements. Uh, I wonder, though, if I might tie this back to something that Anas Sarwar asked about at the outset, which, which just plays around in my mind. I wonder if there's an issue. Anas was asking about people challenges, and particularly, I think this committee's looked at uh, the, I don't mean this pejoratively, but the, the, the pool of talent uh, at, at the top end, is it, it seems fairly narrow. I think we've had several reports that have said, you know that there aren't that many people who can take on you know what are very difficult very responsible roles do you think there's an issue if we start from that position that says there is a narrow amount of people who can do a particular role will there always be an issue if you're having to buy talent in then when it comes to the other end when that the employment is severed that by definition there will be there will have to be a a larger payment because you've had to buy buy in talent at a, a, a perhaps a larger fee at the front end. Does that make sense? It, it does, and I think um, my starting point is it's complicated. Um, you're right. Um, I've reported, for example, quite recently on the difficulties that health boards are having in finding um, the right people to act as chief execs in these really big, challenging jobs. Um, very exposed publicly, um, really difficult changes that need to be made um, in uh, politically fraught circumstances. Um, I think it's also only fair to point out that we pay our NHS managers quite a lot less than NHS managers are paid south of the border, and that adds to the, the difficulties of recruiting people um, who've worked in England and, and are bringing a different sort of experience with them. Um, it also, though, obviously means that the severance payments are lower than they otherwise would be because the, the, the base that you're starting from is lower as well. Um, I think probably my concern is um, slightly um, coming from a different perspective than your question. Um, we do see in areas like um, digital information systems and technology that it's extremely hard to get the skills that are needed to put in place um, big systems like uh, the CAP Future system for agricultural payments, the social security system. And very often what's needed there is paying people um, as consultants on very high daily or monthly rates for an extended period of time. Um, now, at the end of that, there is no um, 
liability for redundancy payments, but we have paid a lot of money for skills and experience that to a large extent are just going out of the, the Scottish public sector again at the end of it, rather than looking at whether there are some roles actually we should be prepared to pay me more for, so that we're bringing people in and keeping them and can develop and spread their skills more widely across the workforce. Um, I absolutely recognise that all the time I've been in this role, um, we've been dealing with the consequences of a policy of austerity that has been put in place um, by the UK government in the wake of the financial crisis, and it's not my job to, to comment on that at all, but it has meant that pay restraint in Scotland has been significant and significant at the higher levels for people earning more than £80,000 a year. Um, we've seen very small increases uh, since 2014, I think. And that's making it more difficult to recruit people um, and making people's choices as they move into the later stages of their career about whether to stay or to go um, more difficult as well. Mr Neils asked questions about the effect of pensions changes, pension taxation changes on all of this. It's a really complex mixture and I think again it's part of the questions that the convener was asking about workforce earlier that we need to step back and see in the round rather than looking at one individual facet of it. Thank you. Uh, I'll now hand over Willie Coffey. Thanks, Karina. Um, Auditor General, can I take you back uh, some years to the times at our audit committee when you would produce all your reports and members in the committee would usually always ask and say, what happens next? <laughs> what do we do now? Could you give us a little flavour of the journey that we've made from that point to this point? In terms of the work that you've done for us and the work that we've tried our best to follow up, do you think we're in a better place over those those years since that question was asked and the, the, where the public sector is kind of beginning to embrace the principles and recommendations behind the importance of audit? I think it's absolutely the right question to ask Mr Coffey. Um, first of all, everybody who works for Audit Scotland um, does so because they want to improve the use of public money and the public services they fund. Um, we uh, take seriously the need not just to identify um, what's, what's happening, what's working and what's not, but to identify recommendations for improvement. Um, and we really do see ourselves as um, one key part of a system with you of um, taking those findings um, by the committee, taking evidence from the government and the other people accountable, um, and making sure that the recommendations are committed to and that there is reporting on progress there. Um, I think we've seen some areas where, where there's been real progress on that. For example, I think the um, Section 22 report on the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts, that regular check-in with the way money is being spent, um, the governance arrangements in place, significant things like um, interventions in private companies has really helped to, to see um, progress uh, happening and happening publicly in those areas. Um, I think the committee's work on your key audit themes, setting out your interest in things like good governance, internal audit, um, digital technology, um, has helped to focus accountable officers' attention on the things that matter. Um, and I think, as I said in my uh, comments uh, a little while ago, I think Audit Scotland could support you even further in doing that, um, in, in uh, thinking about things like um, pre-meetings to help you think about the questions you want to ask us on the record and witnesses on the record um, to explore further, um, to be thinking about how during meetings we can help you to identify which are the, the right follow-up questions or where that the answer you've heard might be a bit shaky. Um, all of those are things that happen in Westminster, in Cardiff and in Belfast. And I think we, we, we would be keen to look at ways to work with you to make the impact of the committee based on the work that we do for you um, as uh, thorough and um, forward looking as it can be. I think we've, we've pushed uh, many of the public bodies more towards embracing quality management systems and standards and processes than they perhaps did in the past. I'm thinking specifically about our IT projects, which kind of appear in front of us fairly regularly, I'm sad to say, but there are systems in place and document guidance and so on. Do you think they're getting the message, Caroline, and are they beginning to embrace what are recognised international standards now that actually do help them do their job much better? 
I'm, I'm absolutely confident people are getting the message. I think if you look at the changes the government's made in its own um, digital support team um, for both government projects, but those in, in large public bodies across the piece, they've really beefed it up in terms of both the quality of the standards and the quality of people who are there. Um, I think they would like to do more. Were they able to recruit um, the right people to, to do that, going back to the conversation I had a moment ago with Mr Kerr? Um, and I think we can see that in examples like Social Security Scotland, where they're making good progress on producing a really big, complex and critically important system. Um, having said that, there are still IT systems where my team and I will sit down and look at what's happened and think, how can they ever let that happen? How did they not see that this was a significant risk to their business as well as to the cost of the system? Have not put in place the skills and the governance arrangements and the assurance that they need. So I think we're seeing progress, but I can't put my hand on my heart and say you'll never see another Auditor General's report about a failed IT system in the future, much as I would like to be able to do that. Okay, then my last my last question for you, Carlene. Um, your predecessor, Robert Black, and, and one of his legacies to the committee was to warn us about the NHS and the need to reshape the NHS from top to bottom. And we're I hope we're, we're in that process. What's what's your message to us as, as you you leave us in, in terms of the biggest issue that you would suggest to us that we face in the in the year to come? The NHS isn't resolved, um, as, as we've been talking about this morning. Um, it's coped brilliantly with this immediate crisis, but I think there is a risk that that um, hides the underlying stresses and strains that I've been reporting on for eight years. So I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, beyond that, I, I think I would pull out two slightly unfair, um, and, and they're both a bit abstract, but they affect everything government does. Um, I'm a real fan of the National Performance Framework. I think it's absolutely right to say not it, the, this is what we're spending, or this is the number of nurses or doctors we want to have. But here's the effect we want to have on the people of Scotland, on their health, their well-being, on equalities, on all of the other things, on people's ability to thrive. But um, we're not seeing a real follow-through between the outcomes and the way government then spends its budget, sets its policies, or reports its progress. And I think that will be critical in helping us to tackle the problems that the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed like never before in Scotland and much more widely. Um, the second is that these new financial powers that we have are significant. They're not, um, they're not the powers that would come with independence, and it's not my job to comment on that. But they're significant and they bring real opportunities as well as real risks. I don't think Parliament yet has a, is well enough cited on those opportunities and risks and won't be until we have both a genuine medium-term financial strategy that sets out what the finances are likely to look like with all the, the uncertainties involved over a five-year period and what the government intends to do in terms of spending um, and unless you have a, a genuine public sector set of accounts that pulls together all of the assets and liabilities as well as all of the income and expenditure. Those two things I think would let um, the Parliament as a whole make um, decisions that you could be confident in about the longer term and would let your committee really focus in on what's being achieved for the money that's spent. Okay, thank you so much for that, Caroline, and everything that you've done for us in the past uh, eight years or so. Thank you, convener. I hand over to Bill Bowman. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, Auditor General, you've been in post for eight years, and I've only known you really for the past two or two or three years. Can I ask you, is the Auditor General now the same as the Auditor General who was appointed in 2012? Uh, in terms of um, me as a person, I'm eight years older and um, wiser and perhaps a tad more cynical than I was then. Um, in terms of the role, I think it's changed significantly, mainly because of the changes in the Scottish Government's financial powers. Um, when I started the role, the Government received about £30 billion a year from Westminster and decided how to spend it. Um, now it raises 40% of what's spent in Scotland through um, either directly Scottish taxation or through its own decisions on income tax. And it has to deal with the long term um, sustainability of getting uh, the revenues it raises and the amount it spends right, as well as making sure that it's achieving the impact that it wants to for it. I think that's the biggest difference that I'd highlight in terms of the role. And it, um, it requires different things of me and of Audit Scotland to support the Parliament in managing those powers. Perhaps I was being a bit cheeky and not thinking about the role, but more the more the person. Um, I think cynicism is a very useful thing for, for an auditor. 
it's an eight-year term. Do, do you think that's about right? Maybe not our gift to, to change it, but do you think it would have been better at six? Or if you had another two years, are you just really getting going that you could have done so much more? Um, I, I, committee members may know that um, when the um, post of Auditor General was established back in 2000, the provision at that point was that the post holder had to retire at 65. There was no term limit, it was a, an age limit. Um, it became clear during the first decade of the Parliament that that was both not compliant with um, age discrimination legislation, but also that it did run the risk that you could have somebody in post for 20 years without um, any change of perspective with all of the risk to independence that brings. So the Public Service Reform Act, I think, of 2010 um, brought in a term limit of eight years. There was a fair amount of debate in Parliament and with the then Auditor General about whether it should be um, two five-year terms, a ten-year term um, or uh, something in between. My view is that eight or ten is about right. Um, I think a renewable term would be a bad idea. I think there would be real pressure to not upset um, the, uh, the government, the majority party in Parliament, um, in order to secure a, a second term of appointment. And I think that would be fatal to independence. Um, eight years at the moment feels about right to me. There are still things I'd like to do, but I think it's been good for me and the organisation to have a clear input point in sight. My counterpart in Westminster is 10 years. I'm not sure there's much to be um, decided between them, but that feels to me like the, the sort of area we should be in, and we are here in Scotland. Good to hear that. I would agree with your comments and the other comments um, about the, the committee, and perhaps it can do more. I, I suppose I feel it's a little bit reactive at the moment and um, would be helpful if we could instigate uh, investigations of our own, but that's maybe a, a bigger discussion. But just uh, thanks for me for your answers and your candid approach. Convener. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Mr. Neil was going to ask that very question, but um, sadly technology <laughs> issues mean we will not want to. So I'm going to ask that question on his behalf. So Mr. Neil would like to ask the Auditor General's views on the committee's remit. At the moment, the committee can only respond to reports from the Auditor General, which he believes, like Mr. Bowman, are restrictive. What do you think about that, Auditor General? Do you think the committee should be able to initiate its own inquiries? I think the thing which distinguishes your committee from all of the other committees in Parliament is that you do have an Auditor General and an, an organisation in Audit Scotland um, which can carry out that work for you. Um, we have the resources, we have the expertise, we have the powers of access to people and documents and explanations to really get beneath the skin of a, a question that um, you're interested in, that the public is interested in, and provide you with that evidence-based factual account of what's currently happening and where there's room for improvement um, that you can rely on, take evidence on, and use to form your own conclusions. Um, Having said that, I, I have heard over um, the years I've been in this role the um, frustrations on some occasions of committee members that there are issues that they would like to explore that aren't either coming out of the annual audit work or aren't on the planned audit programme. Um, and I guess the best I can offer um, in my last sort of couple of days in the role is to say that I'm sure Stephen Boyle, as my successor, would be very happy to engage with you on that, um, to look at how your voices can play into deciding the programme of work that he carries out while not compromising his independence to um, follow the public money and the issues that he thinks are important without fear or favour or political, undue political interference. Um, it's a fine balance, but I think we've all heard the interest of the committee in being able to use your powers on issues that are um, of particular interest to you, and I'm sure Audit Scotland could help you do that and use all of the resources and expertise um, and access that we have to help you do that well. Thank you, Roger. I, I think that um, feeds into the, the point you made right at the start around how we can work much more closely together, and I think that's something that the committee really needs to think about um, and probably have that discussion with your, with your successor. Um, I'm going to hand over to Neil Bibby. Thank you, convener, um, and thanks to you, Auditor General, for all your years of service. Um, we've touched on these issues, kind of, um, in terms of the start. Of the convener was talking about retaining skills in the health and care, the health and care sector, and Liam Kerr was talking about dividends payments. Um, 
public sector bodies, as you'll know, um, Auditor General, have lost a lot of experienced personnel over a number of years um, through voluntary redundancy and early retirement. Um, you know, leaving aside the, the financial impact of that, the public sector is obviously going through a very challenging time with COVID and is likely to be under financial um, pressure, which will result perhaps in a an urge to kind of go through similar schemes in the future. Um, but is there is there sufficient depth of knowledge and experience in Scotland's public sector to deal with the challenges that we've got going forward? And to what extent are we at risk of losing the experience and knowledge that we have in public sector bodies across Scotland? I, I think there absolutely is a risk, Mr. Bibby. Um, we've, we've talked about the NHS particularly this morning. It, it's probably the biggest and most challenging part of my um, area of responsibility. And we have seen high turnover of chairs and chief executives and other senior people, um, partly uh, because of the pressures of the roles and partly because of the um, understandable extent to which um, when something goes wrong, we all look for an individual to blame rather than thinking about the system within which that, that individual is working and the limits that places um, on what they're able to do. Um, so uh, it feels to me that absolutely we need to fund public services well enough so that they can afford to have um, the number and the calibre of people required to, um, to plan, deliver, um, transform them to meet the needs of Scotland in the 21st century. Um, but equally, as I said in my opening remarks, we need a culture which um, is about learning from mistakes, sharing good practice and giving leaders the space to lead um, rather than making people so fearful and defensive uh, that they are sticking to the letter of what's required of them um, with results that aren't in anybody's best interest. Um, it's a really difficult balance, particularly again um, when funds are tight and the uh, political environment is highly contested. But it does feel to me we have seen some real costs to that um, in terms of losing expertise and commitment over the years that I've been in the role. Thank you, Auditor General. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Mr. Bibby. Um, Auditor General, thank you for that, Everett, this morning. I, I should read a tweet that the uh, chair who is currently on maternity leave, or a convener on maternity leave, Jenny Mara, has tweeted to say um, that the Auditor General is giving her last evidence session to the committee um, as her tenure comes to an end. She is disappointed not to be chairing today's session, um, and the professionalism of Carolyn Garner cannot be overstated. Thank you for your exemplary service to public life. Enjoy your new chapter. I know that is something that we will all want to echo. Uh, and On a personal level, can I thank you, Auditor General, for your uh, for your candour, for your uh, advice, for your uh, listening ear, um, and for always uh, being the other end of uh, a phone um, in whenever there's any issues uh, or any suggestions or uh, intelligence required. Um, it's hard to believe that this is your final occasion uh, addressing this committee. You've given eight years of dedicated service to this committee, and I want to take the opportunity on behalf of the committee to pay tribute to your work over that last eight years, to thank you for all the efforts that you have made. Uh, through your reports, through the evidence, and all the efforts and uh, achievements you have had in helping to improve Scotland's public services. Uh, you have managed to achieve a balance rightly between calling out and robustly challenging organisations which are failing in their responsibilities and uh, spending public money, uh, whilst continuing to highlight the bigger picture and the significant pressures that our public services continue to face uh, at this critical time. Uh, you have managed, as you have done again today, steer away from the occasional political questions uh, and rephrasing your response to a position which we could uh, all agree. So thank you for being able to walk that fine line in these testing uh, and divisive political times. Uh, thank you for the support you've given to this committee and its scrutiny over that time. And uh, thank you for your invaluable uh, guidance and expertise. Uh, thank you also for responding to the committee's interests and focus uh, while respecting the independence of the committee in deciding which route uh, to pursue. Um, and on behalf of every member of this committee and anyone that has uh, worked with you over the last eight years, thank you for your service. And we all wish you and your family all the very best for the future. And we are sure that you will be successful in whatever you choose to do next. I now close the public part of this meeting as we move into private session.